Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Daniel chapter number 3. To Daniel chapter number 3. I'm excited again about today's message. I've been excited studying the life of Daniel and the ministry of Daniel. But today, Daniel's not involved in our sermon. He's cut out from this passage. He's gone. He's off the scene right now. The book that's named after Daniel, the chapter 3, does not involve Daniel in any way, shape, or form. We'll talk about why he's maybe not here. You know that we shouldn't live in fear? Can I get an amen? amen. We shouldn't live in fear. One more time, amen? Amen. amen. All right, so we, we shouldn't operate or be controlled by fear in our life. But there's always occasions for fear in our life. Sometimes fear comes in the form of a situation, maybe a bill or some obstacle that's coming, and, and we are afraid of that. Sometimes it comes in the form, like this passage, of some persecution, in the face of persecution. Sometimes it comes from society as well. Right now there is a great fear in society. Help me out, what is it? Coronavirus, Coronavirus right? There's a limitation on how many cases of water you can buy from Sam's Club in Saginaw, Michigan. We know that because we tried to buy them for the youth conference. They would only let us buy it for the first time five cases. Only five. People are stockpiling water and toilet paper. I get the water, but I really get the toilet paper. Because everyone knows in any great pandemonium outbreak in the world, toilet paper is the first to go. And in 2020, we may be without clean water, just go to Flint, but we don't want to be without clean toilet paper. And so I understand it. I understand it. I get it. I, I'm thankful. So if you need some, I've got 400 rolls in my basement, and uh, it'll be, it will be paper gold in just a few weeks. <laughs> no, I, I just. We live in a fearful society, right? I've shared in times past what labels, caution, and warning labels look like. And, and it seems like at every turn, everywhere we go, there's occasion to, to have fear in our life. Be afraid of this. And every, every storm that we had this past winter is always touted, it seems, like the storm of the century. Make sure you're very careful tomorrow because tomorrow we're going to have snow come back after break to hear how bad it will be. Boom, and then breaks the commercials. You're on the edge of your seat. What's going to happen tomorrow? And sure enough, we may have two to four inches. Be cautious out there. And, and the, the snow precipitation may turn to a freezing rain because, heaven help us, we've never had ice in Michigan before. Right? Every, it seems like every forecast has that element of fear in order, and not necessarily from them, from the news station, in order to, to sell, in order to sell some ad time. And we've, in the past, have seen school districts cancel the night before a storm. I was principal for 12 years at Bridgeport Baths Academy. I was in charge of it. Started and stopped with me on when to cancel school for 12 years. Talk about a thankless job. No matter what you do, it's the wrong solution. You know, young people are like, we'll just cancel school, snow day. Yeah, until your parents don't have a way to have a babysitter. Why are you canceling school today? You cancel it, you get it wrong. You don't cancel it, you get it wrong. It doesn't matter. I remember even one time I um, did not cancel school on a day that I did not deem to be unsafe. That was kind of my, my metric, you know, uh, uh, unsafe conditions. So I did not cancel school. I never fought with anybody. If they couldn't make it, that's fine. It's, it's you know, if, if, you know don't, don't die on the way to school. It's not that important, all right? In order of life, it's not a life and death situation. I was at Wendy's later on that day, about 11 o'clock or so, and uh, there was a, a family there. It was some uh, long time ago students of our school, and, and they were eating lunch, and, and they said, you didn't cancel school today. You're an idiot. These roads were unsafe. They called me an idiot. Strangely enough, they're at Wendy's while I'm at Wendy's on these incredibly unsafe roads. Just saying. Thankless, truly thankless job. It was last year, though, that, that uh, in Michigan, the state of Michigan, they had so many snow days, days they closed, I won't even call them snow days, days they closed, they had to petition the state for extra days back so they wouldn't have to go to school throughout the month of July. Because they would close multiple times last year the night before a storm came. Now, I get closing in a storm, but I don't get on the threat of a storm. We may have a storm. School is closed. We may have a tornado tonight. School is closed. All right. My tree may fall down on my house. School is closed. But we live in a very fearful society. 
And if we're not careful, we will begin to, instead of attacking things and walking in, in the, 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 the light of the gospel and of Jesus Christ and his power, we'll begin to walk in fear. And Daniel chapter 3 is a very familiar account. Oh, it's a favorite in Sunday school class. It's the account of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the fiery furnace. What a great, great story in Scripture. I would title the message, Trial by Fire. Trial by Fire. The test of one's abilities and how to perform well under pressure. That's trial by fire. We'll sometimes use this phrase in a, in a job situation. Hey, you can do this. It'll be a trial by fire. What we're basically saying is we're slapping them on the back, saying good luck and watching them go. Sink your swim. Here you swim. Boom, splash. Trial by fire. Here in Daniel chapter 3, we have a true trial by fire. The question I have for you this morning is, how do you face pressure? How do you face the fire? Have you ever faced pressure? I think if we we're honest, we'd all say absolutely yes. Throughout our entire life, we face pressure. Oh, different pressure from, from K-5 to a senior in high school. Different pressure from a senior in high school to a, uh, to a third-year junior in college. And different pressure from a junior in college to a uh, couple who's been maybe married for two years or, or a single in the workforce. And, and different from there than when you're 45 or 50 and different from 50 to, to 65. But we all have pressure, do we not? It's easy to look at someone else's pressure and say, well, that's easy, that's nothing. To look at my kids and say, well, listen, don't worry about that. That's no big deal. Now, in perspective of probably the pressures I face, their pressures are less. But they're no less real to my 11, 9, and 7-year-old, are they? And they're not made to handle the pressure that, that I have to face as a pastor, right? It's different pressure. But it's still pressure. And we're still responsible, according to Scripture, to respond the right way. Have you faced pressure, pressure from a loved one? from a spouse, a wife, a husband, a dad, a mom? Ever face pressure from a boss who's anti-Christian or a teacher or a friend or a fellow classmate who mocks your beliefs? Since the death of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, 43 million Christians have become martyrs. And 50% of that was in the last century alone. They say more than 200 million Christians face persecution every single day. 60% of whom are children. Children. Trial by fire. In Daniel chapter 3, we have the account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if I could direct your attention to two verses. Two verses that I think unlock the key to this entire passage. We'll end up looking at the whole, at the whole pretty much the whole chapter. But I want to direct us, first of all, to these two verses where we see a testimony and I submit to you today that I'm asking and submitting that you would have the same testimony that these young men had and still have to this day. Daniel chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible reads, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. He's able to. He's able to do this. You see the faith right there? Do you see the choice, I believe God? Our God is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. We'll look at this later on, but what a great wisdom these young men displayed. Either way, when they went to the fiery furnace, they were going to be delivered out of the king's hand. If God chose to allow them to suffer a death for his sake, they were delivered out of the king's hand. If he chose, like we know he did, to keep them from the fire, they were still delivered out of the king's hand. What could he do without God's permission? The answer is nothing. Nothing. He had no power over these young men because of their faith in God. That's why he had no power. And anytime we put our faith in God, our trust in God, belief in God, no one else has any power over us. Verse 18. But if not, be it known unto thee, unto thee O king, that we will not serve thy gods, 
nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I just looked this morning at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in trial by fire. Lord, I thank you for your word for this time. Lord, we have a few moments to look here. I ask that you would help us to, first of all, understand clearly the lessons that you'd have us to learn from this passage. Lord, may there, would there be no distractions this morning as I speak? Lord, help me to have clarity of mind, and Lord, help our minds as we listen to be free from distractions. Would your spirit have freedom? And Lord, then I pray that each of us would respond the way you touch us. Lord, there may be some who are facing a very difficult burden or struggle. I pray that you would strengthen their heart and their faith. Lord, there may be some who need to trust you today. Would, would they do that today, Lord? So, Lord, would you speak to us and help us to respond the right way, the way that would please you? In Jesus' name I ask, amen. If you're still there, stay in Daniel chapter 3. We'll begin kind of at the beginning of the chapter. We will not read the whole thing at once. We'll read it in sections as we look at each section individually coming to verse 17 and 18 right in the middle of the sermon. And what we notice right away is that Daniel is not present in Daniel chapter 3. There are a couple of reasons that people have um, given why he's not mentioned in the chapter. One, if you remember, that after the dream, he was promoted to, to ruler of the province of Babylon, end of chapter 2. Daniel was promoted right, pretty much right under or right close to Nebuchadnezzar, the ruler. And here, chapter 3 takes off, same ruler, uh, same time frame, but Daniel's not mentioned, and he probably was not there when this took place. Option one is Daniel was on assignment somewhere else. Option two is that uh, this didn't affect him. I don't see that because in the passage we find out he calls all the chiefs and the, the rulers and, the, and uh, all the princes and governors and captains, so I don't think he'd leave Daniel out. Or, number three, option is he bowed down to the image. And you would not convince me of that ever. I don't read the book of Daniel, continuing on in Daniel, to see that Daniel would have bowed down to a false god. I don't see it chapter one. I don't see it chapter two. We don't hear in chapter three. In chapter four or five, when he gets to Daniel, the lion's den, Daniel's not the compromiser, is he? So because he's not mentioned does not mean that he compromised and worshiped a false god. You would not convince me of that. In fact, after this, Daniel is, is, is spoken to by an angel. And it says, Daniel, thou art well favored. If Daniel had worshipped a false god, he would not have been well favored or thought highly of in heaven. All right? So I don't believe for a moment that Daniel, Daniel, Daniel compromised. On a brief side note in support of your Bible, which God has miraculously preserved for us. Someone has said that this proves the authenticity of Daniel because Daniel's not mentioned. You say, well, how? They brought a great point. I read this. It was a great point. They said if Daniel, Daniel's a hero, right? In Daniel chapter 1, Daniel's a hero in Daniel chapter 2, right? If this was a fictional book, Daniel would have also been the hero in Daniel chapter 3, right? If it was about Daniel, why would he have given the credit to somebody else? All right, but he's not mentioned. You know, if you're writing about a hero, why would you write him out of the story? All right, so did they said this proves one reason for the authenticity that this book is Daniel's a genuine book of the Bible, which we believe, amen? So Daniel's not here. But we see a trial by fire. James tells us the trying of your faith, the trying of my faith, works patience, endurance in my life. Every time that my faith is tested, God wants to make my faith stronger. And sometimes he chooses a trial by fire. Can I be transparent and honest this morning? I don't always like my faith being strengthened. I don't like it being strengthened, really. I like it just the way it is. Because these trials on the front end aren't really pleasant. This is what James says, count it all joy when you fall in diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Because James acknowledges what we all know deep down, that when we face a trial by fire or a trial, it's not necessarily on the front end joyful. So James says, have a different perspective about the trial because this is a good thing for you. But even though you don't see it today, you'll see it tomorrow or you'll see it next week. All right, so I don't, I gotta be honest, I don't know that I like my faith really being tested on the front end. But I sure do like it on the back end. 
When God answers prayer, when God rescues, we know the end of this. Let me jump ahead to the end. When they're in the fire and Jesus is walking around with them in the fire. What an experience to walk with Jesus in the fire that was heated seven times hotter than normal. That, my friends, is a story for your grandkids right there. That's a story. All right? That's an amazing experience. What happened last week? Well, you know what? I went to work. I went home, had a couple days off, and got the lawnmower. What would you do? I walked in the fire with Jesus. Okay, I guess you win today. We all like the back end, but going into it, we're all tempted in our flesh to resist the trial. And James says to count these things as joy. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said the test of a man's character is what it takes to stop him. What does it take to stop you? For some people, it's a coworker. <laughs> you believe in Jesus? <laughs> We're done. For some, it's just the it's just the idea that someone will be against us. And no one has said anything yet, but, but if we say that, someone may say something, the, the threat, the idea of a snowstorm. And we're right here. I can't say that. They're going to reject the gospel. I can't give them a gospel tract. They're going to say no. I just know they're going to say no. I know it. So I don't. The threat of idea, the fear. For some, it's a loved one. What does it take to stop you? You see, the workout machines at a gym... Are, are intended, are designed to challenge you. They're designed to focus on maybe one muscle or one muscle group. And for someone, a weightlifter to grow stronger, he must push himself through the extra repetition. And in a sense, strengthen the muscle. If I can say it this way, life is God's gym. Life is God's gym. And he is growing us. He is strengthening us. He's strengthening our faith through specific trials by fire that test that specific muscle called faith. And God wants to strengthen your faith and my faith. Let's look at this passage this morning just a few ways. The first thing I see in, in chapter number three is the racket. There's a racket going on here. I see, starting in verse number one, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain Dura, in the province of Babylon. It was, first of all, a, a pagan royalty. Pagan royalty. This is Nebuchadnezzar. This is the same character from chapter number one and chapter number two. If you remember from our other messages, and if not, you can jump on YouTube and see them or read your Bible in chapter number two, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, remember? He didn't know the dream, what it meant, or what it was. Yet Daniel came and showed Nebuchadnezzar that there is a God in heaven. Remember that? That's what Daniel said, there is a God in heaven. And Nebuchadnezzar said, there is a God in heaven. Nebuchadnezzar agreed with him. But he wasn't converted yet. In chapter 3, we see Nebuchadnezzar is still a pagan. And he's a pagan king. It's one thing to be a pagan. It's another thing to have the power over everyone else in the country and to be a pagan. You see, this racket begins with a man who should have turned toward God in chapter 1 when he saw that Daniel and his three friends were ten times smarter. If that wasn't enough, he had seen God work in chapter number 2 in having his dream revealed. But now we come to chapter number 3, and he is still a pagan king, ruler. And this pagan ruler puts up a prominent revelation. He builds an enormous gold image. The Bible tells us 60 cubits high and 6 cubits broad. According to our best estimate, that is 90 feet high and 9 feet across. This ceiling right there, if I'm not mistaken, is 32 and a half feet to the very top white part of that ceiling. So go up three, about three times that distance. Or take about two tractor trailers, semi-truck trailers, and stack them on top of each other. Or three two-story houses, that'll do it as well to get to 90 feet. This was no small image. Now, we don't know what the image was. Some have said it was of Nebuchadnezzar himself. 
It, it could have been. It just says that I have found an image of gold in Scripture. It could have been to one of his false gods. But we do know this. It wasn't to Jehovah. He wasn't to the God of the Bible. It wasn't to Daniel's God. It was a false God in a prominent display. Look what I have done. Look, the epitome of our kingdom is found right here in a 90-foot tall, 9-foot wide golden image. Look how great we are. Look what we have accomplished. This is amazing. Hmm. Ever sound familiar in 2020? Look what our society has done. Look what we have accomplished through science, through medicine. Look, look, look. What can stop us? Computers get faster. Cars get smarter. Americans. <laughs> we get fatter. All right. <laughs> look what we've done. Look at our society and capitalism. Look, look at it. Look at, a, look at what we've accomplished. Look what we've done. And, and Nebuchadnezzar, who should have known of the mercy and the goodness of God, because the Bible says you can walk outside and see the handiwork of God in the, in the stars and in the trees, who should have known because of Daniel and his friends, who should have known because of his revelation of his dream, should have known it, instead builds a monument to a false god. We live in a day and age in America and really around the world where people should know about God. He has revealed himself. We are privileged to have access to God's word like we do today. I have it here as in written form. What a blessing to hold God's word. I can hold it all the time if I want to, right? And, and I, I am so blessed, I am so wealthy, that I have another copy in my office. Actually, three more copies in my office. And I'm so blessed that I have one in my car when I go soul winning in the glove box in case I get a different Bible. And, and listen, I know you pay me well here because I have a copy at home as well. And I am so rich, you're not going to help me, deacons, you're not going to ever, ever, ever pay me again. I have an extra copy I take at wilderness camp so I don't mess up my other ones. How many Bibles you got? Right? We are blessed. And you can find these Bibles everywhere. You can go to the hotel, right? Open the door. There's a Bible sitting there. Wow, would you look at that? And not only that, we have it other places. I have my iPad up here. I usually preach off my iPad. My notes are on here. If this dies, I never stop. All right? The sermon has no end. You better hope it doesn't die this morning. In all fairness, there was one Sunday it died. One Sunday the iPad died. What did you, Brother Howell? Pulled out my phone. I've got it on my phone, too. Again, I, I have a Bible app on my iPad, right? I can open up God's Word there. I have actually two on this iPad, I, on my phone as well. You can see it on TV, on your computer. You can drive down the highway and see it on billboards, right? There's God's Word everywhere in a, in a culture that should know about God. It's chosen to reject God in a prominent revelation. They want to tear out the Ten Commandments and remove prayer from schools and from the public square. All right, there's a prominent revelation. We don't want to worship this God. We're worshiping this God instead. And don't misunderstand, Christian, that denying God in the public square is equal to denying God with Nebuchadnezzar. It's still a prominent display of rejection of our God. And he built this 90-foot high impressive gold image. Listen, if you can build something 90 feet tall by 9 feet wide out of solid gold, you, my friend, have made something impressive. All right? I would come over and take a look at it for you. I'd want to maybe be your friend if you had that much gold on hand to waste on a 90 foot high image, three, uh, three times the height of this and 9 feet wide. That's, that's a solid image, my friend. But then he asked for public reverence. Would you look at verse number 4, please? He's gathered everyone in verses uh, 2 and 3. Verse number 4, Then in herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time 
Ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music. Boy, they had a big orchestra there that day. They had a cornet, a trumpet, they had a flute, a harp, a sackbut, which is often considered a, a precursor to the trombone. All right, that's a trombone in Scripture. Oh, and that's a precursor instrument right there. A psaltery, a dulcimer, and all kinds of music. It was a big orchestra that she fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. It was an expectation for this rev reverence. When you hear the music play, you fall down and worship. Just in case you're wondering, the herald said, this is idol worship music. When you hear it, you worship the image. Then he says this in verse number 6, And whoso, whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now, I've seen the end of this account. We know what happens with the story. But I was kind of curious about this. This was supposed to be a, a great king, right? Nebuchadnezzar, he'd conquered nations. He'd, he'd uh, captured many other kingdoms and brought them back to Babylon. And you would think that the people, these princes and governors and all these people would, would love their pagan king for what he's done. But he has to say, when the music happens, you worship, and then he adds this threat, and if you don't, I'm going to burn you all up. He has to add a threat on the end of the worship. Now that's interesting to me. Because we don't threaten in Christianity. We invite in Christianity. He say, would you come to church? And if you don't, you're going to die. Would you sing with us this song? And if you don't, we're going to chop your head off. You wouldn't stick around now, would you? What kind of religion is a forced religion? I'll tell you, false. False. Jesus, in a great messages, and if you didn't get to hear him yesterday, you look him up on YouTube and listen to him on live stream, Brother Young, about Christ's invitation. Come unto me and follow me. Christ invites us in these things. It is a willing servant choice who follows Jesus Christ. We have to respond to him. But Nebuchadnezzar says, listen, you're going to fall down. You're all going to be very willing. Because if you don't, I'll just burn you alive. Public reverence. You see, worshiping a false god seemed like the easy and non-avoidable reaction to have. Boy, you know what? You gave me a good choice, Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to worship. It's like I do with my kids sometimes in a small way. This morning at the Howell House was, was not the best morning of the children of all mornings. I would attribute it to the sin, Satan, and time change in any given order. Boys were going back and forth a little bit like boys will do. and At our house, we don't allow that, you know, to go back and forth, to bicker like that. All right, parents, did you hear that? We don't allow our boys to bicker back and forth like that. Parents, you shouldn't either. All right, that's not Christian. That's not Christ-like. It's not Christ-honoring. And so, dad got involved. Someone asked me, did you use your dad voice? I imagine I did. And as I'm often apt to do, I said to my, my sons, my one son, listen, do we need to correct this a different way? You know what that means, right? Yeah, you, no, you don't, but you know the implication, right? I remember one time years ago, I had a student who was in a little bit of trouble, and they were dealing with it right, and, and I was talking to the, to the father. He was a good father and, and uh, spot on, and, and he said, listen, if my son doesn't follow what you're saying, you let me know, and I will rock his world. <laughs> That's a father statement, right? Rock his world. That's good. I like that. I, I, I'm right there with that. It's, it's what, what every kid, what every kid knows what it means and doesn't want to find out exactly what it means. That's why I was asking my boys this morning, you want me to rock your world? Or you can, or... You can get along and let Jesus rule in your hearts, right? Well, guess what they chose this morning? They chose to, to get along. That's so weird. This is what Nebuchadnezzar was doing. Listen, you can worship my image. Just fall down and worship. You know, just pretend to worship. Just outwardly acquiesce to the worship, and you won't die. The easy response would have been to fall down and worship. 
As we close this morning, can I ask you something? What if those three young Hebrew children had just outwardly worshipped? What if they had? Oh, I, I, I'm not going to worship this image on the inside, just on the outside. I'm still a true follower of God on the, on the inside, but on the outside, I'll, Lord, I'm going to get burned up. I'm going to have to go in the fiery furnace. There would have been no Daniel chapter 3. Right? Because our outward actions are a reflection of an inward conviction. Our outward actions reflect what inwardly we believe. And inside, we're going to look at next week, inside we know that these three young men chose to believe God, even though it would have been easy, simple. And they could have faked it. It wouldn't have been authentic. And God is looking for authentic Christians. Authentic from the inside out. That our outward actions match our inward faith in Him. You see, it may just be a co-worker at work. And you don't say anything like, well, I disagree with what they're saying, but I'm not going to say anything. It's no big deal. I'm going to be different inside. If these young men had bowed down, it would not have mattered what they said they believed on the inside. But they didn't bow down because of what they believed on the inside. The challenge this morning is to be authentic Christians. What's inside will come out. With these three young men, they chose to believe God in the face of a pagan king with a prominent revelation. They didn't worship. Instead, they chose to have faith in God. Trial by fire. What's inside will come out. Lord, I thank you for this, this account with these young men. Lord, I don't know, I can't begin to know every situation that's going on this morning, Lord. Lord, I imagine there's some people here today who are tempted, who are wrestling with, struggling with, following you or succumbing to other pressures. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen their hearts. Lord, I, I don't know what they're facing, but you do. Lord, I imagine that some are facing something they seem to be as large in life as a fiery furnace. Lord, help them today to keep their faith strong in you. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if this morning, while I was speaking, God was speaking to you. Maybe you're facing some particular trial, and it's the most difficult trial you've ever faced in your life before. Well, God wants you to have your faith in him. He'll help you through it. We know the end of the story. But say, Pastor Howe, would you pray for me this morning? As you spoke, God spoke to me. I needed that. Would you pray that I'd respond to God the right way? Would you lift your hand up, slip back down? Amen. Amen. As you spoke, God spoke to me. Amen. Amen. Who else? I wonder if there's someone here this morning. Amen. I see that hand. I wonder if there's someone here this morning who's never trusted Christ as their Savior. That if you die today, you don't know that you'd go to heaven. You've never asked Jesus to save you from your sins. But I pray for you as well this morning. We'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure you can go to heaven. Who would say, Pastor Howell, I'm here this morning and, and I don't know that I'm on my way to heaven. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Just slip your hand up, slip back down. I'll see it. I will call no more attention to you than I did to anyone else. But I'd love to pray for you this morning. Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. Would you pray for me? I see that hand. Yes. Who else? Who else? Can I invite you, my friend, in a moment when we have an invitation to come and let someone show you from the Bible? Lord, I thank you for these hands, these ones who mentioned that you spoke to them. Lord, may they respond in faith to you. And Lord, this one who raised their hand for salvation, Lord, may they please respond to your gospel. May we show them from the Bible how they can know for sure. Lord, bless the invitation in Jesus' name, amen.